thanks so much for joining me. Welcome to my channel. I am deep diving into my laundry bin of scraps here and we collect so many scraps in the studio because today we're gonna be making these super cute fabric and button flowers. The best part about this project is that it doesn't require a lot of skill. Like we're talking basic sewing skills here. So it's a great project for kids to do with a grown up or for tweens or teens or adults to do on their own. So if you learned anything today, please give me a thumbs up and hit subscribe because I will be bringing you new videos all the time and you don't want to miss any of them. My name is Laura and I am the owner of Hartford Stitch, which is where we are today. It's a sewing school for kids and adults right outside Hartford, Connecticut, but I can also teach you through our YouTube tutorials, our video workshops, and our Learn to Sew e-courses. So let's start talking about the materials and tools. So this entire bin is full of quilting cotton scraps or like medium weight cotton. And that's what I recommend for this project. So we are going to be cutting this on the bias. Basically it means on a 45 degree angle or like on a diagonal. So you want to find a scrap and this one is particularly large, like 10 inches by 10 inches square ish. And I'm going to show you how we get the diagonal out of this. All right, and then grab your bobbin and your matching thread. I have this kind of like citrony green color. I'm gonna go on the opposite side of the color wheel. I'm gonna pick this sort of raspberry color, uh, which I don't think I actually have a matching bobbin for. So I'll be winding a bobbin to match that. Of course, your bobbin doesn't have to match, but the way we make the petals is you will see the front and the back or the upper spool and the bobbin at the same time. So if you don't want them to be the same color, that's kind of a cool effect. So it'll be like a little bit twisty. If you do want them to be the same color, then make sure you have a bobbin and a spool that match. You're also going to want a button and you'll see that the button is in the center here and it also serves a really important purpose of hiding all of our little petal ends. So you wouldn't want to do a teeny tiny button like this because it wouldn't hide the ends. You want to look for something that's a little bit bigger like maybe one of these guys. You also need something to put your flower on. I am using floral wire if you have a pipe cleaner that works as well or you could hot glue a magnet onto the back of this to make it a magnet or so a little safety pin in if you want to make it like a brooch or something that goes on a backpack. And that is all you need for materials. All right, so let's talk about the small tools that we need. So you're going to have a pair of fabric scissors. I have so many pairs of scissors here. All right, fabric scissors. You also want to have thread snips to cut your thread. You're going to want a seam ripper. So just in case anything goes wrong, always important to have one of these. Then grab some pins. So if you happen to have long glass headed pins, these aren't actually glass headed, but long glass headed pins, you only need two of them. We're gonna use them to help make our bias tape, to help make the edges curl in. The longer the pin, the better. So if you just have short little guys, they'll work too, we'll make them work. But if you have long ones, like I said, that's the kind you wanna use. All right, so I have these things, seam gauge. So any ruler will do. I really like using the seam gauge in part because it has this little guy here and because it's so small, it's easy to get in for small measurements. But again, if you just have like a 12 inch ruler or just your clear grid ruler, that is fine as well. And what else on the side? Chalk. So whatever your favorite marking tool is, I like to use the Taylor's chalk. And I'm gonna put links for all of these tools down below in the description, because these are obviously all ones that we use at the studio all the time, so I highly recommend them. And then over here, the last thing is a hand sewing needle. You want to find a hand sewing needle that is good and strong. Like you don't want, this one here is like super bendy. Can you appreciate that? I don't know if you can. Super bendy and it won't hold up through pushing through all the layers. All right, and I have two other things for the small tools, and that is to have some sort of ruler. So watch any of my tutorial videos, you know that I love my clear grid ruler. This is a six inch by 12 inch one. And the reason I love this is because you can see the lines underneath it, and that will make sense when we go to actually cut our fabric. If you don't have one of these, just a regular 12 inch ruler will work. I'll show you how to do it, but some sort of ruler. So the other small tool are clips. If you don't have it, not the end of the world. You can kind of just hold things together until we get to the sewing machine, but if you do have them, they are super helpful. So of course you're going to need a sewing machine and then you're going to need an iron. I have an entire video dedicated to ironing and pressing and the tools that I like to use up here. But one thing that you'll see me talk about is my Aliso Smart Touch Iron. And one of the very cool things about this is that it's, we call it the robot iron in the studio. You put your hand on it and it goes down. You take your hand off and it goes up. So you don't ever put it up on its heel like this. Because I'll tell you, in the studio, before we had these, the biggest issue we had is that kids would put the plate up and they were good when they were ironing. They knew that they had to be safe. But then when this went up on its heel, 
they reach their arm around to grab something or do something and get a burn. Our friends at Aliso gave us three iron stews at the studio, which we have been using for the past two years and it has been awesome. And so I highly recommend this iron, especially if you're sewing with kids. So take a moment, gather your tools and materials and let's talk about the bias grain and how we're gonna cut our fabric. So take your fabric. You're also going to want your clear grid ruler or regular ruler, your chalk and your fabric scissors. So if you look, especially if you look at the wrong side of your fabric and look like really closely, even closer. Like, okay, that closely. What I want you to look at are the fibers, the threads. See how we have some threads that are going this way and some threads that are going this way? These are the grains of the fabric. So this is actually how the fabric is made. And if I pull my fabric this way, it doesn't stretch too much. And if I pull it that way, it doesn't stretch at all. But if I pull it on the diagonal, see how stretchy that is? So that's really important for our project. And that's called the bias. And the reason that's so important is because we're gonna have to bend this fabric in order to make the petals. All right, so this is just cut on the straight grain. And see how if I tried to bend it into a curve, it just sort of like puckers. And this one is cut on the bias. And you can see that I can really sort of shape that fabric into a curved shape more. So that's why we wanna cut this on the 45 degree angle or the bias. And let me show you how to do that. Okay, so you're gonna take your square fabric and if your square is on the grain already, meaning that you have those fibers going this way and that way, and it makes sense with the edges, then that's great. If you're not so sure, take a closer look. Sometimes you can find the threads that are coming off and sort of determine where your straight grain is. And I will tell you, it does not always line up with your pattern, which is super frustrating. And again, if this isn't perfect, don't worry about it. Just kind of get it as close as you can. All right, then you're gonna take your ruler and you're gonna line it up from corner to corner and draw your first line. And this is where using the clear grid ruler comes in handy. So if you've never used one of these before, each block is one inch by one inch. And we wanna make another line that is one and a half inches away from this one. So I have one block here, and then each of these little lines is a quarter inch. So I'm gonna do one quarter to one half. So I'm gonna line up the one and a half line on that dark line I drew. And I'm gonna take my chalk and make a line that goes the entire length. So now I have one of my strips. Okay, so let's say you're using just like a regular 12 inch ruler. And this piece is a little smaller and not quite a square, but it still works the same way. So you're gonna draw your line across the corner. Then you're gonna take your ruler and you're gonna find the one and a half inch mark, right? So one and then halfway between one and two and line that up here with the line you drew and draw a little line. Now this is where this kind of ruler doesn't work quite as well as the clear one because it could be like this, right? I'm still technically on that one and a half inch mark. Obviously this is kind of going at a wonky angle. You wanna keep checking that your ruler is perpendicular to the line on that one and a half inch mark and you can make a couple lines there and turn it and draw a line. And if you wanna be super careful, you can then go do a sandy check that's one and a half all the way and see mine's not. So that's why I use a clear grid ruler. But if this is what you have, then I'm sure you can find a way to make it work for you. So I'm gonna go ahead and draw two more lines so that I have a total of like three strips and then I'm gonna use my fabric scissors and cut them all out. So now is a great time for you to pause and do the same before we move on to our next step. All right, so we're gonna set up our ironing board, but if you are a parent and you are doing this project with a kid at home and you're like, all right, now we're at the ironing, I'm just gonna do all of this. I highly encourage you not to do that. Kids can learn to use an iron and I think it's something that's super important. I can't even tell you how many adults I have come in the studio and they say, oh yeah, no, I, I don't iron. I, I don't even own an iron. So it's one of those life skills. They can do it. Give them supervision. Of course, it's a hot iron. So once you feel like you're ready to safely iron, let's get our ironing boards set up to make the bias tape. Okay, so I'm gonna take my pin here and I am going to just take a little nip into the fabric, if you will, just a tiny little bit so it's secure. And then I'm gonna take my seam gauge, I'm gonna set it to three quarters of an inch, which is half of the width of the fabric we cut. So I'm lining that blue long line up with where the pin comes out. And I'm gonna push the pin forward until it's even with the zero mark, if you will, the end of that ruler, and then push it on out again so it's nice and secure. Now I'm gonna do the same thing about six inches down here. And so now I have this channel for putting my bias tape under. All right, so take your first piece of fabric, which probably has a little angle to it. And if it doesn't, you can kind of cut a little one just so you can scooch it under here. And as you're pulling this through, see it wants to squish, turn in this side and then turn in that side. And the goal is to have them pretty even here. So as you pull it through, make sure that they stay even-ish until you get down here and then you can slip it underneath this one. 
So now I have this little loopy bit in the top here, but this is the way I want it to look and this is the way I want it to look. So now I can take my iron and carefully press this. Now notice I don't move my iron back and forth. I'm lifting it up and putting it down because I don't want to smush out folds I made. I also am trying really hard not to hit the plastic balls of my pins. Obviously if I had glass pins that would be better, but give a little steam. Take it on off, let it cool just a second, slide it on and do the same thing until the whole strip is pressed. Now I am going to go through and do that with all of the strips. Notice my hand is getting nowhere near that iron. And now is a great time for you to pause and do the same. Awesome, okay, so now you have three of these all pressed like this. Our next step is that we are going to fold these in half. And so you can do this one of two ways. If you're comfortable with it, you can just fold it in half like this, give it a little finger press and steam it. If you're working with kids and the idea of managing all that is a little too much, then you can set your seam gauge to 3 eighths of an inch and adjust those guards so that they are 3 eighths of an inch away from each other. You're going to take this and you do want to kind of start the fold a little bit, sneak it underneath the pin, sneak it under the pin, underneath the pin so that both sides are lined up and it's easier for kids to see it. They can see where the gap is to make sure that everything's lined up. So I have the opening over here. This way you can do the exact same thing, but their hands don't need to be anywhere near it. So I'm gonna go through and get these other two pressed. Now's a great time for you to pause and do the same. Okay, so now that you're done, if you feel more comfortable going through and putting some pins in to keep these all shut, you can. Though I find that since we're just kind of sewing a straight line down, it sort of holds its shape just fine if you leave it pressed like this. So let's head over to your sewing machine. Okay, so I'm ready to sew and I have all my regular settings, which for me means a straight stitch between two and three stitch length, a zero stitch width, needle position is in the center, and my tension is at a four. Your machine, of course, might be different. And now is also a super fun time that if you wanted to do a fun stitch, like like if you have some crazy stitch on there, why not? It's like a little extra flair to your flower. So all I'm gonna do is sew right on down the center here. Now I'm gonna try to get it a little bit closer to the right side, because the right side is my open edge, because we wanna make sure that all of that fabric in there gets nice and secured in. So I'm gonna speed this up and do it. Make sure you don't watch the video and sew at the same time. So take a look at all your strips, grab the smallest one because that's what we're going to use as our guide. And you want to cut off the kind of raggedy edge. So it's a nice straight edge here. Now, if you start with a 10 inch square, you should be able to measure down to eight inches, no problem. And then if that's the case, you can give it a cut there. So I'm going to go ahead and I am going to cut all of my strips to match so that they're all eight inches. All right, now this is where those clips are gonna come in handy, though they aren't necessary. But what I want you to do is take one strip and fold it in half and find the center mark. And you can just put a little dot of chalk where the center mark is if you can't just remember it. Watch carefully. You're gonna take one piece and scoot it around, kind of like you're turning a corner and line it up with the center. And now I'm gonna take the bottom one and I'm gonna do the same thing, but in the opposite direction. So I'm not folding over, I'm just turning a corner and then I can put my clip on, all right? And so it makes this sort of like figure eight. Now, like I said, if you don't have clips, you'll just make one and then go to the sewing machine, make one, go to the sewing machine. But so I'm gonna make all of these quickly so that when I go to sew, they're all ready. So I have it held together with a clip, but you're probably wondering how are we gonna actually get this underneath here. Once you have it like this, and actually start with your sewing machine turned off so you don't accidentally press the pedal while you're fiddling with it, you wanna get it directly underneath your presser foot and your needle, and then lower your needle into place. So now that needle is kind of acting like a pin, this isn't gonna come apart at all. Now you can turn your sewing machine on, sew forward a little, go all the way back, and then end in the middle again. Now this is super secure and it's not going anywhere. All right, so go ahead and do all of them like that. And then next step is going to be hand sewing. Time to start putting this all together. So you're gonna want your three petals. You're also going to want your threaded needle with the knot tied at the end. And I like to have a ruler nearby just so it's a hard surface to help me push the needle and thread through. So take your first little set there and you're gonna push it right through the middle. And what I often do is kind of get it started and then pull it down using the ruler as a hard surface to push it through. Don't do it on like your dining room table or something or it's gonna leave a nice little hole. And I'm gonna do the same thing with the other two so that we have a nice stack. Okay, once you have your nice stack, then you can lay them out the way you want them to. Mine sort of just fell into place. But this next stitch is what's gonna kind of hold everything together in the shape you desire. So have it together, start it, 
flip it over, make sure your finger isn't anywhere near it, and push through again to secure it. Now I'm gonna go back and forth just a couple more times just to make sure that this is really secure. So now's a good time for you to pause and do the same. All right, and when you're done, end with your needle on the top side of your fabric here. All right, so grab your button and you're just gonna sew this button on. So go up through the one hole, down through the other hole, and then you have a choice. You can either push it all the way through the entire thing, just like we did when we were sewing the petals on, or you can make it a little bit easier on your fingers and just catch the petal underneath. I mean, these aren't really getting like used as buttons buttons. It's not holding together clothes or anything like that. So it's not the end of the world if it's not super, super secure. When you're done, you can just slip that uh, needle underneath a little clump of threads. Don't pull it all the way through. Leave yourself a little bit of a loop and bring your needle through the loop once and through the loop twice and pull it nice and tight. And your flower is done. It might need to be smushed around a little bit, but there it is. Next step is to sew it on. So I'm gonna show you how to sew it on to that floral wire. So I have a fresh length of thread with my knot on the end. I'm going to take my wire, and if, like I said, if you're doing a pipe cleaner, it works the same way, and I'm just gonna bend a little bit of a loop at the top here. So I'm bending a little loop at the top here, and then I'm just gonna twist it off so that it's, I don't have any pointy edges and it doesn't come undone. Grab your flower, and you just wanna center that in the middle. And we're just gonna do kind of a whip stitch all the way around. So go underneath the wire, and then whip it around, and come on up again. Now make sure you're not poking all the way through your petal or you're gonna see your stitches on the outside. And you're just gonna keep doing this all the way around. And you're done. So that's it, that's all there is to it. So remember, the first one always takes the longest, but you're whipping these off so fast as soon as you get the hang of it. We'd love to see what you make with your flowers, whether it's a bouquet or a pin. So if you post on social media, please be sure to tag us at Hartford Stitch and our friends Aliso at Aliso Home and use hashtag Aliso Connects. Thanks so much for joining me and until next time, happy stitching. Okay, if you got all the way to the end here and you're thinking, well, Laura, where's the flower crown that you showed me in the picture? That wasn't my plan at all. I um, finished filming everything and then I was trying to figure out what I could do to take a photo of them. But the flower crown is super easy. So you make a bunch of them, you put them on the wires and then you sort of layer them like this and twist the wires together. You probably want shorter wires, got really long wires. Then do another one like this. And then you want them going the other direction too. So if this is your center one, actually make your center one a little bit longer. Guys, this wasn't planned out. I just sort of did it and it was cute. So now I wanna show you how. So have the center one come up higher than this one and then take another one so that it fills in that gap like that and twist it up. And then you can attach this next one to that wire. Oh gosh, it's getting unwieldy. I don't know, it'd be cute if they went all the way around. This one doesn't. Then you have a flower crown. So then you can just twist these behind you. Ow. Don't poke yourself in the head. As always, thanks for joining me. And if you want to find more kids' videos, check out this one and that one. Until next time, happy stitching. Okay. Oh, it's stuck. Like really stuck in my hair.